Since the 1960s, NASA has successfully launched around 200 manned missions to space. But how do rockets work? If we're going to be talking about how rockets get to space, we should determine what exactly space means. For most purposes, the difference between Earth's atmosphere and outer space is marked by the Kármán line, which begins roughly 100 kilometers above mean sea level. When a rocket is sent to space, it might be sent on a quick suborbital mission, or it might stay in Earth's orbit, like the International Space Station, or it could be sent to escape Earth's orbit, like Apollo 11 and Voyager. No, not that Voyager, that Voyager. Rockets have four key sections. The main structure, propulsion, guidance system, and payload. The main structure is the shell of the rocket, the thing that's keeping it together. The propulsion system generates thrust to get the rocket into space. Technically, the propulsion system is what we would call the rocket, but we tend to use the word rocket colloquially to refer to the whole spacecraft. The guidance system takes readings and maintains the rocket's course. In the past, guidance systems would feed data back to Earth where human computers would need to interpret it. The payload is whatever is being delivered into space. In manned missions, this would be the astronaut, but it could also be a space probe or a satellite. As you might have guessed, rockets are incredibly large and heavy. The Saturn V rocket used in the Apollo 11 mission weighed over 2.8 million kilograms. So how do they even get off the ground? First off, the forces acting on the rocket must be unequal. The thrust lifting the rocket must be greater than the weight pulling the rocket down in order to get anywhere. But how do we generate enough thrust? This is where the propulsion system comes in. Every action must have an equal and opposite reaction. So when the propulsion system fires, burning massive amounts of fuel and expelling the burning gas, it generates thrust in the opposite direction, which lifts the rocket off the ground. Modern rockets use staging to maintain efficiency during the ascent. This means that at different points during the flight, sections of the rocket will break off to reduce mass. At each of these points, the propulsion system will fire in order to maintain the ascent until it reaches Earth's orbit. And if it needs to break orbit, it will need to fire its propulsion system again to reach escape velocity. And that's how rockets get to space. On the 12th of April 1961, the Soviet Union made history when they sent the first man into space. Outside of the mission, very few people knew that the launch was happening. Not even cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin's own family. But how did Yuri Gagarin become the first man in space? Firstly, the Vostok rocket that would take Gagarin into orbit was derived from a Cold War ballistic missile, adapted with a small capsule for a person to sit in. That small capsule would only fit one person. They would need to choose their cosmonaut carefully. The selection was made just days before the launch, with Yuri Gagarin as the top choice and German Titov as the second. The night before the launch, Gagarin and Titov slept on mattresses with strain gauges that would measure how restful their sleep was. Only later would Gagarin admit that he had not slept at all, nor had Titov. Neither of them had known about the hidden strain gauges, but every time someone had come into the room, Gagarin had concentrated hard on lying absolutely still. The morning arrived, they played music in the capsule as last-minute adjustments were made. And finally, they were ready to launch. Vostok 1 orbited the Earth in 108 minutes. And luckily, the capsule was able to descend successfully. Gagarin ejected from the capsule and parachuted down into a potato field, miles off target. I thought it was a monster, not a person. 
he stretched his arms out and was approaching us. Then he asked, Do you have any idea where I can get to a phone? Over the next few days, Yuri Gagarin became a household name and a hero in Russia. And that's how Yuri Gagarin became the first man to go to space. Sally Ride made history when she became the first American woman, as well as a very early LGBTQ person, to go to space. But how did she go from being an accomplished tennis player with an aptitude for science to a crew member on the NASA Space Shuttle Challenger? Born in California in 1951, Sally Ride was encouraged to pursue a career in tennis by world number one tennis player Billie Jean King. However, Ride instead decided to return to college to study science. She earned a PhD in physics from Stanford University, focusing on astrophysics. Sally Ride joined NASA in 1978 and was among the first class of astronauts that allowed women to join. During press conferences, she received sexist questions. Ride considers herself an astronaut and a scientist, and she has little use for reporters who tried to transform her into a celebrity. In 1983, Sally Ride joined the Space Shuttle Challenger as a crew member and became the first American woman in space. She followed the Russian cosmonauts Valentina Tereshkova and Svetlana Savitskaya who were the first women to go to space. Ride's accomplishments didn't end with her career at NASA. She founded Sally Ride Science. She also co-wrote a number of children's science books with her partner, Tam O'Shaughnessy. Her accomplishments as a tennis player, scientist and astronaut, as well as an advocate for young people who want to get into science, makes Sally Ride an inspirational figure in science. You can find fact files and more over on the Twinkle website.